Welcome to Podnuts Pro. This is a podcast where we take you from home computer and repair and we transition you to small business. So we talk about servers, routers, and switches and plenty of stuff that you don't really deal um, with the home end user. And as always, we have Matt. What's up, Matt? How you doing, sir? Good, Lalo. How's everything going over there? Uh, now now that we're broadcasting, the PC is working. Life is just so much better. So, Well, this is a historic show like we were saying it sure is. we were trying to get this up. So it's not. It's okay to have a few issues. This is the first Podnut show, I believe, yes. without Steve. Without Steve. In fact, I, I have to come with the truth here. I was actually crying because Steve wasn't here, so tears had kind of dried up. <laughs> I said, okay, it's time to broadcast now. So <laughs> We had to get control. Yeah, I know. I was like, get a hold of yourself, man. Podnut's pro. But welcome so to that the, says a lot about Lalo because Steve feels comfortable turning this over to Lalo to record, okay. produce. Hey, thank you. So first. first. You know, because there was some pressure already, and now you just increased it tenfold. But that's okay, though. <laughs> so I'm glad. Cool, man. So what are we talking about and today, sir? Well, I thought we could start off reading the email from Scott and talk about that a little bit. All right. Let me let me find that email, or unless you have it in front of you. No, in fact, I got it right here. So okay, all right then. Cool. This is from Scott, and Scott reads: Hi, good job with Podnuts Pro podcast. I enjoy them. Now, mind you, I'm a nuclear medicine tech who likes working on computers. As such, I am the IT department also. Their use of jargon is always in context, so it's easy to understand. Well, we we appreciate that. Now, for my stupid question: We are a small healthcare. I, I'm, a company about 50 users three sites currently we use the hospital's private cloud as our system backbone but when I look at moving to the internet app internet apps like ignite.com Google Pro for email log me in web hosting accounting software QuickBooks and still using on your PCs with office the cost of going to the cloud is 50% of our current cost why would anyone ever need an office based server a network in the 21st century. There must be a reason. So, Matt, explain to the man why what that is, sir. Well, first of all, this is definitely not a stupid question. It's not. Be this is a, a big debate between how things are now and how they're moving between different texts have different opinions. So it's definitely not, not a stupid question. This is a, a main issue. I going think. forward for companies on how they're going to structure the way they do business and how tech support them. And so, yes, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm good. So why would the, let's answer the first question. Why the, the only question, why would anyone need an office based server? Mm -hmm. Here, here's what I think. And in this email, he mentions I don't know how you pronounce it, E-G-N-Y-T-E dot com. Right. Ignite. Okay. That's a cloud file server service. They have – it's basically your file server, FTP, this and that on the cloud. Okay. So you access it over the cloud. The most popular thing about moving to the cloud has been – Google Docs, um, hosted exchange, moving email off, that kind of thing. Right. This Ignite thing, and here's why I think you need a server. I don't think, and I'm not from, I've never used it, but I don't see how you can reliably have your files stored in the cloud that you're using day to day. If I you agree. have. Yeah, so and just look at basic files. Not even basic files. Basic files are okay. Word documents, Excel documents, that stuff's fine. But when you start talking about larger files, sometimes people are using – I mean, today I was working with some clients. They have a lot of drawings, right. 20, 30 meg files. Large or Large, large files. Sure. Right, large files. Those things have to have a fast network. They're on gigabit networking to their servers. I don't see how you can move all these files to the cloud 
and have the speed that you're going to need and the reliability. And right now, it's a, it's a castle already if the Internet goes down and their email goes down. But if you're relying on the cloud and your Internet goes down, now you've lost everything. No, and I definitely agree, and especially he's, he mentioned the, like the word hospital, and I thought about the word HIPAA because a lot of times um, I don't know much about HIPAA as far as the regulation of it. I never had to deal with a network that dealt with HIPAA, but I don't know if they support putting all your, all your stuff in the cloud. I think you have to have it on the file server. It has to, has to be encrypted, and there are certain guidelines that you have to use. But going to your point, it's definitely – to handle files and documents is quite okay, but when you're doing like databases and large files, like you mentioned, I mean, it, it could it could become a, a hassle. So if you have, let's just take an example company that has 40 users. With 40 users, if you're relying solely on the cloud, my thoughts are, even if you have everything on the cloud. How are you going to manage those 40 users and those 40 computers? You have things to, to worry about uh, antivirus software. Right. There's no, there's no centralized server, centralized administration. You've got to manage all those desktops individually for everything. Antivirus, user accounts. Users are going to store things on their desktop. They're going to, no matter what you have set up a server, the cloud, local, whatever. You're going to have to worry about local storage. It's just you're decentra it's too decentralized. The advantage of the server is you can have centralized administration for your workstations, for your users. I agree. Printers. So if, we, if you agree that you have to have a lot of these files locally, you're going to have to have a way to share those and have – access to them permissions you know what you want to restrict some people you don't want everything out there for everybody to get to so with that as soon as you have the need for local files you have the need for a server yes and i agree and you brought up a bunch of good points the reason for a server one big reason shared resources like he said printers shares scanners and devices i mean tons of other reasons to share information when you do it on a cloud not that you can't share files, but how do you share printers or if you have like your antivirus, if it's Symantec or Trend, the micro, it needs a portion. There's a server install on the server that manages all the clients. And how would you do that in a cloud environment? So you they bring up very good points. And there are ways to do it without a server, but then you're talking about managed services where you still have to have – it's more cost. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these cloud solutions – advertise themselves as they're able to save you a lot of money. But there are costs associated with moving to the cloud that the, is not – I looked at this Ignite service, and I did about 40 or 50 users, and they said you could save – it was like $80,000 a year in administration cost. Now, for the small businesses that I support that are 40 users, right. they don't spend $80,000 a year. So I'm not sure where they get their numbers from. <laughs> a lot of these estimates pump up how much administration costs for local services while they minimize theirs. So the, the gap is a huge difference. Right. I, I saw one survey or one cost comparison that said switch to hosted exchange. Now, I like hosted exchange for, in some cases. Sure. I think it's perfect. We just switched over. 70 users between four or five different companies to host an exchange because that's a solution that worked for them. Right. But I saw one survey that said, oh, if you have 40 users, your exchange server is going to cost you X amount of dollars and your administration is going to cost you this much. And it was something like $100,000 <laughs> over like two or three years. And I thought, this is insane. No, that's, that's insane. I can tell you one of my past jobs, I uh... – Administer and it chain bots. It changed 2003 bots with 250, with 250 users. I, I was much less than 125,000 a year. <laughs> yeah. I, I think a lot of these numbers are aimed at higher level managers 
or mm -hmm. people who aren't really familiar with how much they're actually paying for support. Yeah, and I was never comfortable. I like the idea of the cloud and having a few things in the cloud. I'm just not comfortable with having my information out there. I, mean, I know some people say, well, if you use email or FTP, but at least if I have a server, I manage it. I control it. I can back it up. I can restore it. And, but when it's in the cloud, what if this company flip flops? I mean, I have no idea who the company is. I never heard of it before. But you know, that could be a valid the company. But that's a fear that I would have. I don't know about you, Matt. Is is I can put it. It's not my fear, mm -hmm. but it's not my data. Right. I explain those risks to the person who the business owner. It and a lot of small business owners aren't comfortable with not knowing who has their data. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't put my data on the cloud. I'm capable of having my own server and, man and managing and maintaining it. But sure. a smaller business of 20 or 30 users on the edge of maybe they don't need a full-time guy or maybe we just call somebody when something breaks. Right. If they're thinking they can switch to the cloud and eliminate computer support person, they, they, that's not going to happen. Yeah, and I just never got that thought where I with most jobs, um, if you want to cut a position, they go, well, just cut one of the the IT guys. Well, that makes sense on paper because you have no idea what the IT guy does, but, you know, he actually helps support your infrastructure. And I guess this this company, that's how they target people. So I'm not against cloud. Well, I kind of am. But, but I mean, I, I me dealing with servers for, for the past the 10 years, I know what they're capable of, what the job function is, and how powerful they are so and that's why I will always quote lean toward a server I mean with the cloud stuff especially if you're a public if you work for a public traded company and I know the the, the we could not have anything in the cloud it had to be all local or in, in, in a data center so I think people who are just getting into business support they might be inclined to have the cloud do these services for the customer because one, it's it is probably easier to set up. A lot easier, yes. For for somebody who's new to starting doing business support. The problem is you're setting up it's not a problem, but in my eyes, you're setting up this company with somebody else. I would prefer to either manage the servers myself if they want off site servers or put a server in you're almost build, building a network that they won't pay you any money later on for support right because what's going to happen is more than likely they're just going to they'll need support mm -hmm. because they things happen but they're going to think they can handle themselves they'll call this cloud file server service and try and deal with them directly they'll probably get frustrated and end up calling you but you're pushing all the services away from something that you can't directly manage. Right. And that, for example, the one thing that comes to mind are map drives. And can you map a drive to a cloud service? I'm pretty sure you could. But uh, um, with a server environment, it's, it's quite easy. Just just make a part of the, the login script, you know, and server, server, you know, slash, slash, like the server name, and you're in there. I don't know if it's that easy to do with a cloud a service, you know. I don't know. And so if we look at a company with 40 users, let's just say, okay. if they use Google Pro, it's $50 a user. That's $2,000 a year for those 40 users. If you've got this cloud file server that he looked at, I got a ballpark price. It was between two and $3,000 a year. So between that, you're looking at $5,000 a year paying for Google Apps Pro and cloud file storage. Cloud storage. I'm not sure how much storage that was. I just put in a number. That's pretty significant because over three years, that's fifteen thousand dollars. They could have gotten a server much cheaper than fifteen thousand dollars, or not much cheaper, but a little bit cheaper. But now it's theirs. They have they have access to it. This, I think the service is going to be the same because when we put a server in, I don't, we don't spend a lot of time maintaining the servers. Well, the calls that we get are 
not directly related to the server, but since we have access to the server, we can fix it easy, easier. Right. I forgot my password. I deleted this file. Um, you know, simple things, really, day-to-day -day stuff. They're going to have those issues if their services are on the cloud or not. In fact, uh, going on their website, let me go to the browser here. They they do offer a local cloud, a, a, a office local cloud, a personal a local cloud, and an enterprise a local cloud. I was like, I wonder what that is. So when I click on it, it's actually a, they put an, a NAS device in your office. So it's probably a NAS device that interfaces with their site and somehow brings the data back and forth. So it's still... You might as well get a server. I mean, uh, if you're gonna put, pay, whatever that cost is for their a Netgear NAS. So. Okay, so even with this service, they're still putting a physical device in your office, um, and then probably syncing that back up to the cloud in this specific instance. Right, and with, and with the local cloud, which um, I, again, I didn't. It's like the, the first time I've ever been on this site, so yeah. I'll do some more in investigating, and, and then we can poke around. So I don't know too many people that actually use the cloud as heavily as some people want to, so for a lot of reasons. Now, Microsoft is even pushing the cloud with Small Business Server 2011. The Essentials version has no Exchange server in it. They're it does pushing, not. It does not. Not the Essentials. Okay. It's, it's for 25 users, up to 25 users, and they're, they're at that size, they're expecting you to use a cloud service for email, either hosted Exchange, Google Apps. So even with these smaller businesses, the trend is going toward the cloud, but with the advantage of th a server in-house, you still get centralized administration for user accounts file storage and I think that's more likely I'd be I'd be more comfortable with that than having everything in the cloud okay if you have something with, with everything in the cloud and no server even just you get a new computer the computer comes in you've got to create a local account because you're not authenticating to a server you have a local account that user can forget it of course because they forget their passwords all the time and their usernames never never you're not going to have, unless you put something in advance in it in place like managed services, which is going to cost more, you can't have a centralized antivirus server, so you've got to manage that locally. What's going to happen in every peer-to-peer -peer network is somebody's going to have the bright idea to sh share their C drive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They share everything. I go into somewhere with a server and they weren't really trained how to use it. Everything's shared. Mm -hmm. C drive, Adobe printer, XP, you know, the Microsoft Office document printer, printer one, printer two. It's all shared. It's all Everything's shared. shared. Um, there, there are third-party apps, and I believe that you can also use the net use, the command or net share from the, the command line. It will sh show you all the shares throughout all the, the different workstations, and you'll be surprised on how what Matt's saying, people just seem to share Everything, folders on their desktops, their resources, their printers. They've, I've seen people share printers that are already shared on a server. I'm like, wow, okay. Yeah, you go to somebody's, you know, go to printers, and if it's set to auto-install shared printers, you'll see 50 computers in there. <laughs> yeah. Because everybody shares their printer, even printers for some reason Adobe PDF. And you, you never get a call saying, I can't print. We're trying to print to Microsoft XPS printer from somebody's computer you can't do that so with and that's peer-to-peer -peer stuff because they're trying to have a way to share things you don't have that when you have a server because they have a place to share their files that we set up with permissions so you're gonna have those issues immediately without some kind of server I just in my opinion you, you have a need for a server he says a server network in the 21st century you do have a need a lot of these programs have to have a component loaded on a server and he mentions accounting software quickbooks well QuickBooks. a lot of companies outgrow quickbooks very quickly yeah. and they have to move to something larger 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, so those kind of things need a server because the server can bone a server client base. So you run a workstation install, and you've got a, it, the database resides on the server. Yeah, and I worked for small networks. I've worked for the medium and large, and uh, I've never seen a medium to large business adopt the cloud for many reasons. So for that might tell you something. If a large like a corporation is is willing to to spend a half a million dollars on on licensing, you know that might speak for how strong the infrastructure is that compared to spending only so much for cloud services. But all right, man, good good topic, good email from uh, Scott. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, the cloud is going to be around. There's always going to be a big debate yeah, about I, that. Yeah. User without without a server, I think the administrator. When I have, when I go into a peer to peer network with even ten or fifteen computers, their administration is more than it would be with a server. Yeah, the server is an upfront cost, but your administration goes down, and it's usually a lot more when it gets to that eleven or twelve to fifteen or higher, mm-hmm. because you have the ten user connection or ten connections limit. If they're trying to use a server, let's say a Windows XP Service Pack 3 computer as a server, they share a folder on there that can only handle 10 connections to it. Right. So if you've got, let's say you're sharing two folders and you've got six other computers, if one computer maps to that both shares, that's two connections that are open, mm-hmm. not one. And then they share a printer. So one computer can easily connect, have three connections to that computer. Yeah, quite, quite easily. And the folks that are listening to this at home or in their car, if you're watching live now, those of you that have managed a peer-to-peer work group, and then those of you that have managed a server infrastructure are, are probably just nodding like your head saying, yes, you, you need a server. <laughs> Life is so much easier. So Definitely. Yeah. So you, And I think it's good. Overall experience, a lot of customers, when they're at that point, we have to convince them to get a server. We highlight the problems they're having, and we tell them how the server's going to solve that. We also, if we haven't been doing, if we have been doing work, it's easy to tell them, you paid us this much over the year for support, and these are all issues caused because of, that could have been taken care of quicker or it wouldn't happen at all if we had a server in place. So, and if we haven't been doing work for them, we'll ask them, you don't need to, t- so you don't need to tell us, but just you get together with your people and look how much you've spent recently on computer support. Sure. And they know how much they spent. I don't need them to tell me. No, I can tell because when they call us and they have this laundry list of problems that, that they've been having, I know they've been having problems. So usually when it gets to that point, when they go at the server, they're much, much happier. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, it, the environment I currently work in is about over 4,000 the PCs, and we got about 400 the servers. And a lot of times when there's a problem, it easily fits because it's on the server at, and because it's centrally the, the managed. I, I couldn't envision having that many the PCs and having to see you know, 400 different people because they have an issue. So, cool, man. And with the server, especially small business server, you get a few other advantages. Okay. There's there's SharePoint. There's what I like, remote web workplace for remote access. He mentions right. log me in. But, again, log me in is not something you can manage centrally. If you're using log me in free, if a user wants remote access to his computer, they're installing log me. I guess they would install log me in free to their own computer, but you can't manage that. I don't even like log me in free on any computers. We train them on remote web workplace, Outlook anywhere. Right for for a for a small business. Right if you're if you're dealing with the home user, and log me in is it it's the best product best product out there. But what Matt is saying, understand it's for centralized management imagine if you had a network with 200 the pcs can you imagine that long list of log me in the computers and then how we discussed the last show if you rename a pc or if it goes to marry the bob it just becomes a nightmare 
Right, so Remote Web Workplace is there for everybody. It's easy to tell them how it's a link. You just put in your browser, you connect to it, you log in with your domain, username and password, mm -hmm. and you connect to your computer. It's quick, it's easy, it's centralized, I can manage it. If they say it's not working, I can go in and see why it's not working. It's th if you don't have a server that's managing this, different users might have their own method to connect to their computer. So Now, let me ask you this. I, I come from the server environment, not from small business. Is it something as simple as adding a user to a, a group, the remote desktop group, or do you go and do additional steps? In, in, a, in a bigger environment where I come from a server environment, you add the user to the remote desktop users group, and then at that point they have the right to remote desktop. By default, they're going to be put in the right group to okay. use remote web workplace. Gotcha. So if you don't want them to use it, you need to take them out of it. Oh, okay, good. Or or change the template defaults so they're not put in there. Good to know. Good to know. So oh. let's see. All right, man. In in the, the, in the, yes. Anything else you want to talk about this right now? No, as far as the email, I think we covered. So, and uh, what else did you bring to the table today? <laughs> Add a few. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I love it when, and this is funny with business, but I, don't, I try not to let it get to me, but it just really gets under my skin. Um, a couple of calls. We don't get a lot of calls for removing viruses and spyware. With the amount of clients that we have, which is easily 150, 200 businesses that we support, you think we'd be removing viruses constantly. But we don't get a lot of calls for that okay. because of the things that we've talked about that we have in place. But <laughs> and then wonder what the call is for. I, I'm using spyware and viruses because it, the scans take a while. I love it when I don't know if you get this too loud, though. I'm sure you do. A, a customer calls with an issue, and I say it's gonna. I can connect remotely and try and do this remotely. If not, I'll have to come on site and try and do it or bring it back to my office. They said, that's fine. How long will this take? And this is good when you're doing support. No matter what you say, the customer is going to hear what they want to hear. <laughs> I could say, it'll take six hours. And what they heard is, it'll take 20 minutes. <laughs> so... And I'm not sure if the home users, because we don't do a lot of home users. Okay. I'm not sure if it's both or just business users that hear what they want to hear like that specifically. That's so both. I get a call this. Yeah. Okay. So I get a call this morning, eight thirty. He's got. Well, this is funny. He tells me he has a problem with Outlook. He says Outlook won't open. So I say, well, are you getting an error message? No, it just won't open. So. I said, well, let's do a remote session. We'll use Log Me and Rescue. He says, now normally when you have Outlook won't open, it's an issue of a corrupt OST file or a corrupt profile. Something's wrong with Outlook. Okay. You know. So he says, well, I can't get on the internet. Okay. So you can't open Outlook and you can't get on the internet. Is everything else working? No, nothing really works. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so the initial description of Outlook's not working isn't complete. Right. He says, no, he says, no nothing works. Okay, well, that's a little different. I said, what happens when you try and get online? He says, well, I get a pop-up saying I'm infected. Okay, so you are getting the pop-up. Again, a piece of information you would have loved to have known. Right. So I connect like I normally do when, he, when a user can't get online and go to log me and rescue. I log into the server through RDP, and then I RDP to his computer. Okay. Because while he can't open up Internet Explorer or run programs, I can still use RDP to connect to the computer. So I connect, and he says, how long will this take? I say, well, I haven't looked at it yet, but I'm assuming you're infected with something. So it's about 8.30 in the morning. The soonest I can tell you is going to be after lunch. So maybe 1, 2 o'clock at the earliest. Okay. But... As soon as I'm done, I will call you. 
and I tell them if you're sitting at your desk, you're going to see it reboot a few times. Just leave it alone. Don't touch it. And I will call you as soon as I'm done. Of course, in my office, we have caller ID mm -hmm. on our phones. We've got an IP phone system. It's not an hour later, and I see they're calling. Receptionist picks up the phone. She, they want to know if you're done. Okay. <laughs> what time is it? 9.30. Okay. So I told her, no, I'm still working on it. Can you please let them know that it's going to be definitely after lunch before it's at the earliest, and I will call them as soon as I'm done. I get a call at noon. Uh, they said you said they said you said they'd be done by noon, and they haven't heard from you, so they want to know if it's done. I said, well, I didn't say noon. <laughs> I said <laughs> after lunch at the earliest, and I get this constantly. And I, I know I don't. I try not to let it get to me, but but it, it does at times. It, it does. It does. It does. It's one of my pet peeves. I told and I and I tell I pick up the phone. I talk to the customer. And he says, hey, you said you're going to be done by noon. And I said, well, I think there was, and I tell him nicely, I think there was a communication problem. I think what I said was the earliest I'd be done would be sometime after lunch. And I, that I would call you as soon as I'm done. And I have to remind him, I will call you as, I'm not going to go to lunch. I'm going to work on this. I'm, I'll be here working. <laughs> So don't uh, – just to keep put his mind at ease, I'm not going to take off for an hour. Right. Now, when I start a scan, I do leave and go pick something up. But when I come yeah. back, the scan's still running. Ten uh, oh, technically, okay, you're okay. still working. Right, I'm still working. So. <laughs> but that happens constantly. So when you're doing support for this kind of stuff, I could say be clear in your communication, but it doesn't matter. They're gonna okay. hear exactly what they want to hear. No, and, and and I agree. And I'm always surprised on how many people they contact me. And everything's a DEFCON for a situation, you know. So can this wait or is this an emergency? Oh, this is an absolutely emergency. So just because you can't go to a web page, you can't be productive anymore. I mean, it just, it just drives me nuts, you know. But right, everything. Everything is an emergency, mm -hmm. and that's because when they're in, when they're using it for their business use, especially if it's somebody who's trying to do payroll, or it doesn't matter what it is, they can be trying to get on Facebook for lunch, exactly. and they they'll call that twelve o five because they just noticed they can't get on Facebook. One time, I got a phone call because they couldn't go to FloridaLottery.com. dot com. <laughs> and it was extremely urgent because they had to check their uh, numbers. And this was not a joke. <laughs> right. And when that happens, this is why we have a central point of contact. Okay. Because I don't want a user at a company calling me and saying they can't get on a website. It's a very good because point. Because that's if a user does call me, I'm going to look at it. So I'm assuming that because we've talked to the, we talked to everybody about central point of contact. So I'm assuming that they're calling, they got permission. So I'll do it and I'll take care of it. And if the customer complains when they get the bill, why didn't authorize that? Okay, well you need to let your people know that they need to go through you. Mm -hmm. And they, and of course they'll say, well, only take calls from me. And I let them know we can try to do that. But when we're managing a few hundred companies, I can't have a, a sticker checklist, yeah. of everybody. Because certain, I say you need to train your employees to talk to you first, not mm -hmm. not not put that responsibility on us. Oh no, and and I totally agree. And it's the culture, like you stated, what they have in their company. I'll give you another good example. I've been in some places where they believe in the help desk ticketing the system. If you work in this type of environment. You get a help this case with notes who the who the problem is, and that's how you conduct your business. But in some places that took the help desk a system and just tossed it out the window. So it's whoever calls you, whoever knocks on your door, and it, it drives you nuts. It drives you nuts because you, you cannot be productive because you have to stop in the middle of what you're doing to go help person B. Then person C comes along, and it's like and then people are upset. I mean, it drives you nuts. 
Yep. So, and I had I had another call. Sometimes businesses will try to do their own work to try and save money. <laughs> I've talked about customers before who, when I'm out there, they say, can you show me how to create user accounts on the server so we don't have to call you for that? Normally, I tell them, no, we're, we're a service company. We don't really train people for that kind of thing. It's like taking your car to a mechanic and saying, can you show me how to do this? Because I don't want to bring it to you next time. Uh, that's a good point. But what if the you get a director from uh, the president that you you need to show the Mary how to add user accounts? Well, we'll discuss that. If that happens, then this does happen. We explain to the boss, we can, if you really want us to, we can show Mary how to add users. The problem is I can't, in a quick training session, teach her everything I've learned over the past 15 years. No, I agree. So I can show her the wizard on how to add a user. She one, she's not going to remember. She's going to forget. Sure. And two, more than likely, she's going to screw something up. And when she calls me, she's going to say she did what I showed her to do. So I let the owner know if if you're going to do this, you can prepare for increased administration cost because it's not going to save you money. It's going to cost you money. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened today. I've showed <laughs> I showed a user, not a user. It's the office manager. And then I've showed her a few things, and this is kind of funny. I showed her how to create a user account, and it's it's very simple. As far, in my opinion, you go to the wizard, you create the account. Well, she created two accounts today, and when she tried to go on the computer, Outlook wouldn't open. It would give an error. So she calls, and she says, I don't know what's wrong. I created these users and they can't open up Outlook. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I, I had three dogs. I've, I fed them bones and treats, so if they bark, <laughs> I apologize. But <laughs> go ahead, Matt. So I connect to one of the user's computers, and it says something about Outlook cannot be installed or something. Now, other users on this computer can use Outlook, so I know it's a user issue. I can log in as administrator or any other user and open up Outlook. Okay. But with this user, I can't open up Outlook, and it's both users that she set up. And I said, so what happened with these accounts? Did anything unusual create, happen when you, create, when you were creating them? She says, oh, I got an error, but I just clicked it away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That's good. So I said... We need, when you're creating user accounts, and I'm telling her this, when you're creating user accounts or doing anything on the server and you get an error, you really need to document that error because we'll need to troubleshoot. You shouldn't get an error going through a wizard to create a user. Right. Oh, I didn't think it was important. Well, okay. <laughs> errors on servers are usually important. But, well, okay. So in the end, I found out in this specific case, and I don't know what caused it, but there's a registry key that didn't get created when the user logged on. And I don't know what she did when she logged on and opened Outlook because, according to her, she didn't do anything. Right. So I found this fix, and I wish I could find the exact error message that she was getting. But let me see if I have it here. In my... is, it, is it under profiles, like under the, the registry? Profile okay, is? yeah. So the error that they were getting says the operation failed due to an installation problem. Okay. Restart Outlook and try again. If problem persists, please reinstall. Talking about Outlook. Okay. So after a little searching, I found the fix for this. It's a very easy fix, but I don't know what caused it. Under H key current user, so for this user only, software, Microsoft, Office, 11.0, because this is Outlook 03, okay. slash common, or slash Outlook, depending, I think mine was slash Outlook. 
in this registry key, I had to create a new, a new D word entry, just name it user data with a value of one, and then Outlook opened fine. Hmm. I didn't find anything about the cause of this, just the fix. But I, and she, when she, of course, she asked what was the problem, and I say there was some registry keys that weren't created for this user or for these users relating to Outlook. And of course, she asked, well, why not? What happened? And I say, well, I don't really know. I didn't create the user account, and I didn't. I don't know what error you got. So without that information, all I can tell you is there were registry errors. Right. So had I created these two accounts, it probably would have been a minimum charge, half hour remote charge. Okay. But since I had to go in and try and find out what she did and then try and find the fix, it was an hour. So like I explained to the boss, it's usually more expensive to have your people try and do things. Oh sure, and uh, when I want to get asked that question, you know, I will let them know that it's I it's a time-consuming process to train my own people that I would hire that have a technical background, and then also explain to them I have certifications or a degree. You know, it's the average Joe a lot of times can't do it not because the process is hard, what, but the troubleshooting factor is. Now, for example, you seen that you got that error, so what did you do? You did some research, you seen, okay, I have to go inside the registry, you you know, and you went to the appropriate hive and you fixed it. How many people would go that route? I mean, for for heaven's sakes, she didn't even pay attention to the error. Not anything against her, it's just you have to have a technical mind to deal with these issues that come along. Yeah, the first thing she said she was gonna try uninstalling and reinstalling, but she just wanted to check with me before she did all that because she didn't feel like doing that. So I told that may have fixed it. I can't say, sure. but without knowing what you did, I don't know. And when I'm looking in the accounts, I went to go look in the accounts to try and look at the user account to make sure the mailbox was created. Okay. I see a bunch of users with just first names. And and that, I don't like that because as we said before, if there's a user with just a first name, when they email somebody, just it says from Mary. Yeah, Mary. No last name. So I asked her, what, why do these accounts only have a first name? Well, I tried to rename them. <laughs> okay. You tried or you did because they used to have a last name. Right. Well, they got, and she goes, well, they got married, these, these two specific girls, and I was trying to change their last name. I said, okay, well, you, you took out the last name. So something easy. You right-click on it, rename user, type in the name, mm -hmm. and she got that wrong. Yeah. Now this user is funny because it's one of our clients who have who their bill is usually the biggest bill <laughs> of the month. Okay. And it's partly because they try and do so many things themselves. But hey, but you warned the powers that be that this was the case, and they said, and they gave you a, th a thumbs up anyways, huh? Right. I don't. And the owner actually prefers this person to try before they call and I was up there one day in their in their upstairs office where his office is and these and these girls they have a conference table in the middle and that's usually where I set up new computers plug into the network set it up there and then move it to their desk and he one day he was joking he says why are you always here and I said <laughs> because I, and I told her name I said because so and so gives likes to give me more work <laughs> So I kind of told him because she's really screwing things up. But uh, now I showed her one time I like IP printers. I don't like printers connected with USB or parallel ports and shared out that way. Mm -hmm. I prefer a, a printer connected to the, in, to the network with a network card and either shared from the server or if needed – a local TCP IP port on the computer. Right. So they were getting a lot of these. It's a, it's a fairly big place. They've got five or six big buildings. So she says, well, we're going to be replacing a lot of our local printers and work with these network printers. Can you show me how to do this? I said, sure, I can show you. Um, so I showed her the first app, connect it, get the MAC address, do a, res a reservation for it, 
because I'd rather have a reservation in DHCP as Always. opposed to a static IP on the printer. Always. So you have a reservation, and you do it that way. Now, of course, the next print, next three or four printers she got, I had a. She called me. We did a log me and rescue session. I showed her again how to do it because she forgot. So she didn't call for a long time about printers. And I was and I was over there one day looking on the server because they were having IP conflicts with some things. Okay. Now the I, in that particular case, some user plugged in a Linksys router, and it was conflict and it was uh, doing DHCP and giving out addresses. Yeah. So that was the issue. But while I was there looking at it, I noticed an extra forty. DHCP reservations for everything. And I asked her, what are all these reservations for? Oh, they're for so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. I was like, so these aren't in the, in the description I put what the printer is. So when I see the reservation, I can see the printer. Sure. I don't just leave the, the blank with an IP address and a, and a MAC address. Right. I said, well, there's no descriptions on any of these things. What are these for? Oh, she got a new computer and he got a new computer. I said, these are for computers? Yeah, didn't you tell me to give a reservation for everybody? I said, no, that's not at all what I said. <laughs> I said, for printers, we give reservations. Oh, I thought you said for everything that connects to the network. Oh, jeez. Right. And if you're listening to this and say, why would you give a printer a reservation? Let's say if you give a printer the IP address, I don't know, 172.181.100. For example, so 40 people or 50 or 100 people that connect to that printer. Then it gets a new IP address. Now it's dot .105. All them people now can't print, and your life will become hell because your phone will be off the hook and you'll probably be installing these printers forever. But if you make a reservation, the, the, that printer's IP address will always be dot .100 if you set it that way. And it will take it out the reservation for DHCP, so the server will never give the IP address to a, a PC. So that's the purpose behind uh, behind that. Yeah, it's easier to document than all these static IPs. Sure, N I agree. And what I found was she had given some static IPs because before she called me, she forgot about the reservation. Uh. So she had given some static IPs inside the DHCP scope. Actually, I think what she did was whatever IP the DHCP server gave her, she just input that as a static IP address in the printer. So for a while, I was having a lot of conflicts and people were having trouble connecting until I found those. Yeah. And so the, it, it just, and that's normally now when people, even when they ask me, I've had to tell them, I'd prefer it if, the, if she doesn't try and do anything on her own. That's what I prefer. <laughs> she is and, not married. No, and it's it's your, it's your company. You can you can the decision is ultimately yours. Sure, but don't expect us. We have other customers as well, and you don't have a service agreement. And, and one, if she had, if they had a service agreement, we wouldn't even do a service agreement if she was going to continue doing that. Mm -hmm. Or if they insisted, anything caused by her would be excluded from the agreement. Sure. So if she says, I tried to create a printer and I'm having errors, or I'm trying to create a user and I'm having errors, that's not subject to the required callback time from us, and it's going to be billed separately from the service agreement. Now, and, and you're saying that you had this type of agreement with this client? No, we don't have this. So I was telling the customer, oh, okay. it's, if you want to continue having her do this work, gotcha, that's gotcha. fine, but... When she messes up something, you can't expect us to jump. I got you. So you can't call. Now, I'm happy to help if I have nothing going on, which is. Which is never, huh? Which is never. But I tell them, if there's nothing in the queue, you, of course, you'll be the next in the queue. But <laughs> if she is on the server and crashes it, you can't expect us to drop everything and service your company because she's trying to learn on your network no and i agree and uh some of you at who are listening or watching now are saying who would conduct business that way if you worked that in enough 
a network, you'd be surprised who has the privilege, and I will call it a privilege, to make major modifications to, to things like, like Matt is talking about. It does happen. And she never asked for this job. Uh, and it normally comes up to where somebody knows just a little bit more than someone else. So the boss might have needed help with iTunes one day. ITunes. And she and she goes in and fixes the iTunes to sync music to the iPod. Well, now to him, she is a computer genius. So you should now be able to manage the server, all the users, and everything. So we're going to let you start doing that too. <laughs> now, she doesn't want to do it. She admits she doesn't know everything. But a lot of times management says, you try it first. And I don't give the admin password to anybody but the office manager or the owner. It depends on the size of the company. Okay. And so if it's given to anybody, it's given to them by that person. Right. And we can tell what's been done. And a lot of times they'll – they have issues when it takes us a while to fix something that was caused by an employee. But as soon as they start to complain – we tell them the time spent is doing research on what was done before it was called us. Sure. That's always the most time-consuming part. If you would just call us, you would, the bill would have been a half an hour charge as opposed to a four-hour charge researching what happened. Sure, because and of, you know, and for and when you work on networks enough, each person if has a different way of doing something. So. Matt, and I assume that you have this protocol in, in your business on, on how everyone does a certain function, like depending on what it is. So, so you can qu quickly look at something and say, that's not the way we configure things. You know, like someone was making a, a change. So Definitely. Definitely. I can look right away and say, I know we didn't do that. Right. And they'll say, well, we didn't do it. <laughs> um, I know we didn't do it. Not only that, we document our, in our ticket system, everything's documented. Mm -hmm. So I know if we did it, and I can tell by looking at it, like you said. I said, we didn't do it. And they, it happens. Just be aware that it happens. Oh, now, sure. this also goes back to if we're dealing with – sometimes we deal with a company, especially when we just take them over, and they're not familiar with how we work. They might say, okay, you're going to take over the servers, but we're going to have this other guy managing this other part of the system. Like he manages the workstations. Okay. He's cheaper. He's cheaper than y'all. We're going to call him for desktop support. And we normally tell the customers we don't work like that because we're not aware of changes he's making. And one, he can't have the password, any administrative password, because he doesn't need it. And if he does have it, he can't have too many hands in the pot. Right. We'll tell customers it's fine if you want to use him but we're not going to do the servers while he's doing the desktops. It's going to come down to he said, she said. He might change something that affects the server and says he didn't touch anything. Yep. So who are you going to believe? You need one IT company supporting this. Right. You, you, don't, you don't need multiple. That and the other problem that you run into is when they call me up, the desktop guy, and say, well, that is, that's not – my problem, it's, it's a server issue. Then they're calling you, and they have to wait to get in the queue, and then six hours and they pass by, and you go, no, that's not a server issue. That's a desktop issue. It just leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth, like you were saying. Right. It's not a good experience for the customer. They're trying to, but it goes back to that they're trying to save a little bit of money, but in, in the end, it's going to cost them more because he'll, the desktop person will be out there waiting for us, or we'll have to wait on them. It gets to where now we don't even do that. If there's going to be somebody else there, Good. it's fine. If they, if it's fine if they don't know the password and they're dealing with things like um, changing a keyboard. <laughs> but <laughs> if they need it, they can't have the admin password. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the admin password in a network, he's not talking about – or are you also talking about the local administrator password? No, you're talking about the domain no, admin the password. The domain. I would prefer not to have anything. Oh, no. I totally agree. And I <laughs> prefer people not to have any admin passwords, but definitely the domain one, no. Because you can call – you know, with a local admin, the password, you can blow up the PC. 
But if you're running a domain, I mean, you can do stuff that it, it's just untraceable. Well, not really untraceable, but it'll, it's, it can do a lot of damage. It can. And one thing, here's one thing we do when we take over a network. When we take over, like it's you in a squad with shields and riot gear. Right. We come <laughs> in with, yeah, riot gear. That's exactly what we're going with. <laughs> we just form a line and just push our way through. <laughs> Users just slash them down. <laughs> so... A lot of things overlooked is the local admin password. We, I like to reset all those to a, a strong password on all the computers. How do you do that? Do that manually via script through? There's a script. There's a script, and it depends on the size of the company. A lot of times, if it's an average small business, 20, 30 computers, we have to get on the computers anyway for something. So we'll just do it when we're there. Okay. But there are scripts. I know Sys Internals, one of the utilities there, has a script that can reset all the local admin passwords. Mm -hmm. uh, and I forget the name of that script, but if you go to that, and I know Mark was on the other night. Yes, he was. But there's one of those utilities can reset local admin passwords. And a lot of times, new computers that are set up are just left with blank admin passwords. Yeah, and... Uh what I've also done in the past is make a script, use the net user, the command. I use PS exact. I think that's the tool that you're talking about, and system internals. And I have a list of, I reference a list of names from a file, and I just hit every single box. But there's tons of ways of doing it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So do that. A lot, a lot of times people will, and I've seen this before, they make their users restricted users on the computers. But then they forget about the four local accounts that were created that are blank passwords that are administrators. So yes, I <laughs> I'm really surprised when I I walk up to a box, not really in a corporate environment, but uh, in smaller businesses or a home user, and they go, well, I don't know my password, and I type in administrator and, and hit enter, and they're like, so what was the password? Nothing. Right, yeah. and any domain you can just hit Control Alt Delete, administrator. Log on where it says either to the domain or this PC. Pick this PC, leave it blank, hit enter. See if it logs in. Sure. And it's you'd be surprised how many times that works. It which happens. It should, it should never work. Mm -hmm. And people wonder how viruses spread. Well, they're, they're a restricted user. Yeah, they are. But the viruses know the look. The, a lot of the viruses are written to check administrator account either with a weak password, admin, or a blank password. Mm -hmm. So it just runs with those rights, and it can spread. Yep, I agree. So what do we take away from this show? The cloud's no good for now? That uh, <laughs> I should not go off air so it will never happen again, <laughs> at this problem that we had. Um, but the cloud, under your research, um, it's not at this point of the game through the networking world. I don't think it's really that recommended in most environments, but definitely do look at research and uh, – Again, if um, you're not too familiar with servers or, you know, there's this sense of, you know, I just don't know what's going on. You know, there's tons of research. There, There's books. There's virtual uh, machines. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that can help you with the transition of going to a server. And it's not that easy. It's not something that you can pick up. But, but I mean, there's tons of stuff that is out there. Um, I, I don't know. Do you agree, Matt? Yeah, and I, I was looking at this Ignite, back to this just for one quick second. <laughs> this, all they're doing is they call it the cloud, but they're using the term cloud, and they call it a local cloud, which is just a server with your files. And then that backs up to a, a, probably an appliance online. So it's no different than a, a physical machine that backs up to the cloud. And we provide that for our clients now mm -hmm. with, with different appliances. So, sure. you know, just be aware of what they mean, the cloud. I think it has its place for some situations, just like everything else. Right. It's based on the situation in, in this specific instance. But generally, it's, a, it's the latest catch phrase or catch term, the cloud is what hot, what's hot. Somebody might want to use it because it's the cloud. It right. sounds nice. Um, and techs, a lot of small businesses use whatever their computer person recommends. Very true. 
So if the cloud is going to be used, the decision is either going to be made by the small business owner who just hears about the cloud online in the news and just goes with it, or it's going to be recommended by the tech. I think you should go with the cloud. Sure, and um, and I'll make another example here. I'm we look at Facebook, and a bunch of us are on Facebook, and. How do you feel that Facebook has all your pictures and all your your friend list and all your comments and private conversations all on the cloud? I mean, you don't technically, I guess, you don't own those pictures all on their service. I mean, so if that, you know, that that scares a lot of people. And just think of it when you're dealing with personal files, with HIPAA laws, with you know HR files. I mean, it it still applies. The same concept. And as far as support, you. I like to I think I provide good support for my customers. They're they're yes, happy. And you know, thank you. And I I don't none of not any of our clients have asked, should I move to the cloud? They don't because they're happy with their service. Now they, they I'm sure it'll come. I'm sure it'll it'll come to a point where eventually they say, Hey, should we move to the cloud? Sure. But But that's where you 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 have to do your research and then you know, offer them an answer is year and a but do your research so and then you can see what the pros and cons are I mean if you're supporting the network and it's totally up to you especially if you're getting paid for it but just you know just just make sure that you check all your available options so well we're getting ready for it because we're we're testing and partnering with some people that will be their cloud so these devices that are put in like the local cloud mm -hmm. and then the cloud files over will be providing those so if you want to still have the cloud for the client but still have the money for you, <laughs> you're going to have your own cloud solution for people instead of pushing it off on somebody else. You know, I and I understand why it's called the cloud, but I think like white, the puffy marshmallow man. <laughs> I want to hear the word cloud. You know, we're like, we're like, we're like all your files just walking around. But um, it all come raining down one day. <laughs> Door has sent me an email. Um, I know that we talk about documentation, and he found this cool tool, and it is on. I ho hopefully, I'm saying it right. It's cdproject.com, and what this tool does, it does your network documentation there for you. It does things such as all Windows-based PCs, as change, SQL, Linux. So um, I tested this on my PCs at home, and uh, it produced a 38-page report. I would show you this document, but there's a lot of information I probably don't want you to see. But some of the information on this report that it did is the BIOS, install patches, the product keys, backup, antivirus, um, IP configuration, event logs, local groups, local user accounts, printers, running processes, startup files, shares, virtual, the memory. It, and I had emailed Matt and Dor the, the PDF that I it created and it was a pretty cool report off the one the machine now I haven't done any server based environment I'm just saying I just ran it on my local bots but um, especially if you're going to a new environment where they have you know five ten whatever number of PCs it, it is a BBS script that you can just run from the the command line I think it's CS script that ETC and then a simple the command and you can actually run this on every box and get a good uh, a capture the environment so and you know what you're dealing with. Matt, did you take a look at, at this tool? I did. I've seen it before and that's a pretty nice tool to gather information about the computers. And that that is a free solution, right? That's that's not a paid solution. Yes, right? from from what I can tell and um I So that's pretty nice because I, I've I've known of some paid solutions like Belark has a uh, yes, paid solution. I agree. But the city one is nice for a, uh, a free. And that report is very detailed. So it has all the information you could possibly want. Yes. On a laptop that I have that's not part of any type of network here at home, it's just one that I use, I carry around. It produced 38 pages. I run a Windows 7, I use Outlook, I have my Chrome browser, and it produced 38 pages of information. So. Cool, man. Yeah, that now, Belark, uh, B E L A R C. Yes, love that tool. Loved it. It's good. You know, it, 
it's good for home users if they want to know what's on their computer. It's free for personal use. Right. So if a home user wants, is curious about what's on their computer, sometimes I'll ask the, the user if they call about upgrading or this and that. I say, well, what are the specs on your computer? And they don't know. So I direct them to Belark.com and tell them they can install that and then send me that report. Um, so that's a good mm -hmm. tool. And the, the paid version is really nice for larger companies. I, I think it's cost prohibitive for a small company, but for a large company, it's it's pretty nice. No, and it was a great tool. And when I did uh, a PC repair for home users, when I gave them the invoice, this was, was one of the reports that were uh, attached to them. So pretty neat, pretty neat. Computer um, Pro, Computer Pro in the chat mentions something called BG Info. Yes, a BG Info. It's what I used to use. Uh, I don't know if you ever seen that before. Let me pull up a screenshot, and then a bunch of people have seen this. Just I never knew what it was called. Oh, that's one of the system terminals. I did see that yes, before. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's the one that shows you like IP address on the desktop or you something. You got it. Okay. And, and let me show here. Let me find one right here. And I'll go to the browser. Um, in one of my environments, I had this run. Uh, you can do it through the command line with certain the switches. I had this run automatically at boot up. Um, so then I would always know just information what the IP address what the IP address it grabbed. It, sh it should be static, but I would include stuff like hard drive space and how much it was used and all that good stuff. So at login, I could glance and kind of see an overall snapshot of what's, what's going on with the server but awesome tool though especially for the server environment if that's what you de that's what you're dealing with workstations i kind of don't do that because most people change their wallpaper anyways but for you gotta tool. have web you gotta have web shots right i'm sorry <laughs> you gotta have web shots right <laughs> all the nice kittens and flowers changing constantly um it's funny that that you say that uh as i mentioned before the place I work for the local, the government, and we are upgrading 4,000 PCs to Windows 7. The common question that I get right after we deploy it, um, how do I change my wallpaper? <laughs> like, it, it's, just, it's just so set in their mind that they want the kittens, you know? So. Tell me, can it's Windows 7. They, they, that's a feature from older operating systems. You know, it was funny that we were that thinking about locking that down. So, we, you know, it's not... Certain environment is nice for when the public that comes in that they all have the same desktop, but they got pulled. So, yeah, and that's I see Computer Pro made a good point, and I actually had this this week. A user asked why, when she connects from her house, her remote session is so slow. So I connected and looked, and she had web shots changing oh. background every like three seconds. And I said, "Well, you need to disable this when you connect remotely." Oh, but I like it. I like my kittens. <laughs> And she, and she had kittens and flowers, which is why I said kittens and flowers. I said, well, th this is not good for remote access because it's having to redraw the screen constantly. Well, no, I like that. I said, okay, well, then you can just be slow because I can't speed this up while you're using this. Right, and what, what Matt is saying is Duke is barking in, in the background. If you have that wallpaper, especially, it has to redraw it every single time it changes. Uh, when I remotely connect to some PCs, within the LAN, what I'll do is punch up a notepad and I'll make that the full screen. And it makes my experience yeah. a, lot, a lot faster. But yeah, I mean, if she wants that web snapshot or whatever that is, geez. And the sense. problem with web shots is it's still running in the background. It's still updating the background. You just can't see it. But right. any complicated, yeah, I like to make it blank, like Computer Pro says. But I, so I disabled web shots and just to show her how, how, how faster it was. And she was like, wow, that's much, that is faster. But <laughs> but can you put it back the way it was? Yeah, oh, no problem. Man. No problem. I said, why don't you upgrade your internet connection at your house and at your office to, you know, the 50 up, you know, 50. 10 down plan. <laughs> and that way this might work a little better for you. But that's expensive, yeah. Yeah. But you, you'll have your kitties and your flowers. Um, all right, then, cool. Is, is there anything else, sir? Not tonight. Awesome. It's the first show. Thank you, Steve, for allowing me and Matt to go ahead and keep keeping the show on. You will see Steve on future shows, so he just didn't go away, okay? So he'll be back. Um, you can find Steve's podcast, of course, you all know, but if you go to podnuts.com, 
you can catch this show and, and many other shows that you can download and listen up. Matt, where can people find you, sir? People can find me. Where can people find me? I on know. Twitter. On Twitter sometimes, Podnuts Pro on Twitter. Or email me at Matt at podnuts.com. Awesome. Cool. I'm usually I'm usually hiding behind <laughs> my three monitors at work. You're hiding. You can <laughs> email me at Lalo at podnuts.com. Also go to betterpctech.com. I'm currently working upgrading but the videos. I know I keep saying that, but if you ask Steve, I got a mad table over there with virtual and physical boxes and, and testing out my script. So uh definitely make your life a lot easier. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the show. We greatly appreciate it. Send us those emails. If you have any questions, and we'll just read them on air. So, Man, a good show, my friend. Yes, good show. I think uh, I think I have a – I wonder if I should share my upcoming topic so that way I'm forced to do it because I change my mind like every day. Okay. Well, go ahead and share your upcoming topic, and then we'll close the show and do a little bit of a post-show. Go ahead, sir. Okay, so how I'm thinking terminal server versus remote web workplace versus VPN, remote remote access for users. That's a tall topic, my friend. And I think mainly it'd be which, when you'd use which solution. Oh, okay. Not the details of how to set them up, but when, if you've got a user that wants remote access, which type of remote access would be best for that user? All right, then. Well, Matt said it. That would be the topic for next week, so I will do our notes, and we'll, and we'll be on. So, again, thank you very much for listening, and hopefully you enjoyed the show. So, thank you.